Welkom bij Spijt bij de Vanavond plaats voor ons Alfa Noé, Californische filosoof. Um, u dacht dat bewustzijn iets was wat zich afspeelt in uw hersen. Alfa Noé heeft daar een heel ander idee over. U dacht dat wij zijn ons brein niet zo gekke gedachten was. Alfa Noé heeft daar ook een hele andere visie. Hij heeft ons verlost van een aantal misverstanden. En één daarvan is dat het bewustzijn iets is wat gebeurt in je hersen. The phenomenon that interests me and that motivated me in writing this book is what I call the phenomenon of presence. Presence, as I think about it, has two aspects. First, there's the fact that the world shows up for us. The world is present for us in our thought and in our experience. These walls, all of you, these columns, these lights, this screen, are present. They show up for us. The, the phenomenon of presence has a second aspect, which is we show up. Here I am. Here you are in this place in this environment. My basic idea, my, my contribution, such as it is, is that presence does not come for free. We achieve presence. And like everything else that we achieve, we do so only thanks to the situation in which we find ourselves, thanks to the skills that we have, thanks to the resources that are available to us, thanks to an environment, an environment which includes stuff, but also includes technology, and also, most importantly, includes other people. We experience the visual presence of so very much more than strikes our eyes. When I look at an object on the table, I have a sense of the visual presence, even of the unseen parts of the object. We experience the visual presence of things which are occluded or partially hidden and out of view. We are not confined in our visual experience to surface. It would be crazy to think that we are. It would be a wild falsification of our visual experience to say that we are. No, I have a sense even of the hidden parts of the things that I see. I have a sense of the visual presence even of the unseen parts of the things that I see. What we see doesn't seem to be confined to what is visible if we think of what is visible as a matter of projection into the eyes. I would say that my sense now in my visual experience of the unseen portions of this column, for example, is none other than the fact that the unseen portions are available to me by merely moving, by moving my eyes and moving my head and moving my body. And the thing which is remarkable is that now, these unseen portions are available to me. So my thought is that in what does your sense of the presence in your visual experience of the unseen portions of the things you see consist? Well, it consists in the fact that you now stand in a certain kind of embodied, skillful relation to the world that gives you access to those features, that enables you to achieve access to them. They are now available to you. So it's, it's a subtle point because the idea is, is that that in which the present consists is my understanding now that I have a kind of access to it. Or consider my visual sense or your visual sense of this detailed visual field. I may be now looking at Seneca in the center of my visual field, 
But, but as I look at her, it is the case that I now stand in a relationship to the gentleman on the periphery of my field, such that by the merest movement of my eye, or turn of my head, I can touch him with my eyes. He is now available to me. I now stand in an embodied physical relation to him, which is the relationship of access. So my proposal is that presence is access. I said before that my main idea is that we achieve the world's presence. I'm now going a step further to refining that. What it means to say we achieve the world's presence is that we have the skills to achieve access to it. By acquiring skills, we expand our reach, and so we literally expand our consciousness. And this is true. This, this then indicates the place, if you like, the, 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 the slot for technology and how critical it is to understanding ourselves. Um, the final point I want to make about this proposal that the fundamental modality of the world's presence to consciousness is its availability is that all of this is now happening in the ecosystem, in the environment. It's not happening in our heads, between our eyes and our brains. It may depend on what's happening in our heads, on our eyes and our brains, but it depends on so much more. It depends on our bodies and on our ability to use those tools and move our heads and negotiate our situation in the world as in the case of more complicated technologies, it depends absolutely irreducibly on the availability of other people and their participation. So if you want to understand where the consciousness is happening, if you want to understand how we are achieving presence, my preliminary conclusion at this stage of the talk is don't look to a neural event. Look at to an ecological process. We do not have any better understanding how the brain gives rise to our experience than we do how Descartes' spiritual stuff did. This is the famous explanatory gap that philosophers have recognized. If you look at neural systems, they just seem to be qualitatively inscrutable. If you beam down like a microscopic alien and look around inside the brain, you can't tell whether there's experience going on. And if there is experience going on, you can't tell whether it's auditory experience or emotional experience or sexual experience or, or, or visual experience. We just don't even have the beginnings of a brain-based theory of these things. We do not, we do not, we do not. Now, here's what I want to suggest to you. Here's a really astonishing Hypothesis. Consciousness does not happen in the brain. Not because it happens in an immaterial, mysterious soul substance. Not because it happens in the world thanks to some kind of group magic. Consciousness isn't that kind of thing. Consciousness is something that we do. It is something that we make. It is something that we perform. It is something that we enact. And like everything that we do or perform or make or enact, we only do so against the background of our fully embodied, environmentally situated, socially situated lives. So looking for consciousness in the brain is a little bit like looking for the dance in the musculature. It's like looking for the value of the money in the paper it's printed on. You can take the very best electron microscope that there is, and it's not going to help you better to see the value of the money. And I think a very similar point can be made about brain imaging technologies such as PET and CAT and fMRI. We've been looking for consciousness in the wrong place. My conviction is that we need to start looking for consciousness in the right place. How would you, how would you answer a person if he would say to you, 
well, you would agree that in, say, frontotemporal dementia, people do you know, pretty awful things, funny things, bizarre things. And they are traceable rather exactly to damage to the frontal lobes. What would you, what would you say against the, the statement that in, in such a situation people do have a reason to say, well, you are your brain, aren't you? The brain is necessary for experience. And damage to the brain is sufficient for certain kinds of disruption in experience. But the brain is not sufficient for experience. And damage of the environment is sufficient for disruption of certain kinds of experience. What I want for us is to recognize that the brain, the body, and the world make consciousness happen. 